Judy Um, and I'm a polyglot based in Seoul, South Korea. 안녕하세요, 여러분. 만나서 반갑습니다. Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Judy, une polyglotte qui vient de la Corée du Sud. Je suis très content d'être ici. Hola a todos. Me llamo Judy. Estoy encantada de estar hoy aquí para darles una presentación sobre idiomas. Mi pasión de la vida. Hola a todos, espero que você esteja bem. Bem-vindo. Wow, that was a long introduction. First of all, a huge thank you to the Polyglot Conference team for inviting me to speak at such a prestigious conference. I would also like to express my gratitude to all of you who have tuned in to watch my presentation. The title of my presentation is called The Linguistic Divide of the Two Koreas. And now let's begin the presentation. So this is a picture of Korea. Korea, what is the first thing that comes to mind? BTS, Korean food, Korean beauty. Yes, Korea is well known for all the aforementioned culture. BTS, Korean food, this is actually Korean barbecue, and Korean beauty, Korean cosmetics. However, from my experiences abroad and talking to foreigners outside of Korea, I realized that the question that I get the most is, are you from South Korea or North Korea? Indeed, this is a baffling question. I sometimes wondered if they were saying this mockingly because they should know that if I were from North Korea, I would not have been able to access the internet nor travel abroad. Therefore, I used to think that this was a sign of pure ignorance. However, given that the media and foreign press intensively portray North Korea and South Korea relations in the politics section, I now know that this is an issue that world citizens pay the greatest amount of attention to and something that could potentially be of great interest. This is a picture of me wearing a um, Korean traditional dress in a traditional Korean palace. Now let's get to a more fundamental question. Why is Korea divided into North and South Korea? Why am I getting these questions in the first place? In order to understand the division of the two Koreas, we first need to understand the Korean history. Okay, so Korean history 101, here we go. We first need to put this in world context and examine this from a wider point of view. Actually, the concept of a split country has existed throughout history, as we have seen in the cases of Germany, which was split into East and West, and Vietnam, which was split into South and North. However, the majority of once split countries in the past have reunified, leaving only a couple of divided nations in the world, one of them being North and South Korea. Now, I will walk you through a little bit of Korean history and provide pertinent information as to why Korea is split into two. I would like to tell you more about Korean history, but as Korea has a history of more than 5,000 years, it would be impossible to address it entirely. So the first pertinent uh, historical fact that has to do with the division of the two Koreas will be the Second World War. From 1939 to 1945, the Second World War broke out across the planet, and Japan became an enemy to the United States. At the end of World War II, when Japan surrendered to the Allies in 1945, the Korean Peninsula was split into two zones of occupation, North and South Korea. The Soviet Union and the United States divided the Korean Peninsula at the 38th parallel, with the Soviet Union, Union taking control of the North and the United States, the South. You can see that this part, the northern part of the Korean Peninsula was taken by the Soviet Union and the southern part was dominated by the United States. Um, 
And the line in the middle here is the 38th parallel. Since the Korean Peninsula was officially divided in 1948, Seoul and Pyongyang established their own respective governments. So that was a quick rundown of the Korean history. And actually, the track I've chosen for this conference is a window into my world, which shows, which aims to show you my world, reality, and community. I've called it a linguistic window into my world. Like I've mentioned, as I know that there is a profound interest in North Korea and South Korean issue all around the world, today I would like to take a moment to relate that political agenda with linguistic interests because this is the Polyglot Conference. Hence, today we're not going to discuss neither North Korea's nuclear programs nor the highly controversial political leader, but rather adopt a linguistic lens and explore how the Korean language has evolved along with the division of the two countries. In this presentation, I hope to walk you through the linguistic differences and demonstrate the differences by relating them to political, ideological, and cultural roots. I wish to utilize this as an opportunity in which language lovers, Korean learners, and history politics fans ponder upon the values of languages, not merely as a tool of communication, but rather a window into the world. So up until now, I gave you a little introduction as to how my presentation is going to be unfolded. And now um, the table of content is the following. I'm going to uh, give you a little introduction about the linguistic evolution and then move on to the orthographic and phonetic differences, then move on to tones. Later, I will also get to some of the words that reflect political ideologies, foreign loan words, and then I will sum up the uh, uh, presentation by giving a brief conclusion. So no, linguistic differences. Ever since, the two Koreas have developed into two disparate worlds, not only politically and ideologically, but also linguistically. These linguistic differences have been portrayed in the media, as seen in the recent TV series, Crash Landing on You. This TV show is about a Korean woman while paragliding in Seoul, South Korea, is swept up in a sudden storm and crash lands in the northern Korean portion of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. This is a scene where the woman meets the man for the first time, and the phonetic differences between the two characters are evident. Let me show you a little bit of the TV series right here. So she's now in North Korea. He says, I'm not in, nor in South Korea, but you are in North Korea. Whoopsie. So they're North Korean soldiers the word luxury and high class when she even speaks Korean. So I'm going to elaborate more on this later, but South Koreans heavily are dependent on English vocabulary when they try to express their thoughts. So anyway, this was a scene where um, the woman meets the guy for the first time and they tried to have a conversation using their respective languages. The woman was speaking in South Korean and the guy was speaking in North Korean. So for those of you who don't know Korean, these differences might not be as apparent, but this was just to give you a taste of how different the two languages sound and how the media has portrayed the stark differences. 
there were some phonological differences that South Koreans and North Koreans would easily be able to notice, but they try to kind of exaggerate it because they had to show that each character represents a different nation. So that was your first um, exposure and introduction to the dialects. Now, let's look at the linguistic evolution more in detail. North Korea introduced new rules for Korean orthography in 1954 and published the standard Korean language in 1966. From that moment, the languages in North and South began to diverge significantly. Also around that time, North Korea began to refer to its own language as cultural language to distinguish its language from the one used in South Korea, which called it standard language. The cultural language in North Korea is largely based on the Pyongyang dialect, which um, Pyongyang refers to the capital city in North Korea. Specifically, North Korea's cultural language is quite different from South Korea's standard language. This is because it is inspired by the speech patterns of the working class. And because of this, the North Koreans replaced Chinese characters in foreign words with Hangul, uh, the Korean characters, and native Korean words. Now, if we look at some of the more detailed differences, first of all, we can see the orthographic and phonetic differences exist to serve and highlight uh, their linguistic and national identity. Please notice that the spellings and pronunciation are different in two languages. So first of all, if we look at the chart here, uh, keep in mind that the general rule here is that the R sound is kept. So if we first look at South Korean, woman in South Korea is yoja. It starts with a Y. Whereas in North Korean, when you try to say yoja, you have to put an extra R in front of it, which uh, sounds ryoja. And yoksa, same goes for yoksa, which starts with a Y here, but in North Korean, you have to put an extra R in front of it, which makes it sound ryoksa. Kyuyu, which also means rules, uh, you can see that the R is added here. Kyuryul, it's pronounced. Uh, once again, the objective of such difference is to emphasize one another's identity. For example, if we hear the R sound, we would naturally associate that R sound with the existence of North Korea. And this is what they were kind of aiming at. The second difference has to do with the tones that are used for political words. North Koreans also uses double consonants to pronounce some words like wonsu or boksu meaning enemy and revenge, respectively, instead of wonsu and boksu, which are kind of pronounced softer in South Koreans. So double consonants, this is a part where um, non-native speakers of Korean have the most difficulties with because it is kind of a tricky pronunciation difference. So there is a single consonant and double consonant. So a double consonant is where you pronounce a consonant mm, stronger. If we see one S, that would be S in Korean. And if we two, see two S's, that would be S. S and S. You see the difference? But if we also take a look at the chart here, we can see I'm just going to move myself a little bit so that you can see my PowerPoint better. Yeah, am I at the right place? Okay, it's going to be here. Okay, so in South Korean, enemy is called wonsu. There's only one consonant, single consonant is used here. Whereas in North Korean, 
you would put an extra s here, making it a double consonant. So in comparison to one su of North Korean of South Korean, it would be one su in North Korean. Also, a word that means revenge in South Korean is poksu, and in North Korean there would be an extra s in front of it, making it poksu. So the difference would be poksu and poksu. Yes, that's the difference. Um, two Korean speakers in South Korea, words pronounced with double consonants generally sound more aggressive. Especially in North Korean news programs, North Korean presenters use fluctuating and confrontational tones in order to be provocative. Mostly, the words that are pronounced with more vigor are related to the communist regime or their political ideology. Another difference is the existence of words that reflect communist ideologies. These words do not have an equivalent in South Korea because such concepts are not in use. South Koreans find many North Korean words rather unfamiliar. Those words include Dongmu and Suryong, meaning revolutionary colleague and supreme leader. North Korea created numerous words and phrases that have to do with the communist regime, including Hubide, which refers to the youth group of Workers' Party, Spirit of the Red Flag, Spirit of the Piercing Wind, Pekdu, and Tolima movement. Of course, all these words sound pretty strange to South Koreans. Another difference is that North Koreans refrain from using foreign loanwords. In South Korea, there are thousands of English loanwords. We tend to use the English vocabulary while just pronouncing it with Korean accent. For instance, for lotion, we say lotion. Mascara, mascara. Lipstick, lipstick. Sunscreen, suncream. Juice, juice. Record, record. So you see how all the sound is kind of Koreanized, but have the essence of English words in it. However, in North Korea, how they um, refer to these words are very different because they try to translate it literally to Koreans. For example, lotion would be water cream. Mulkurim is the literal definition of water cream. Eyebrow paint would be mascara, just literally translated. Eyebrow paint and it's nun mok. Also, lipstick is lips blusher, and ipsur is lips, and yonji is blusher. So you see the 101 equivalents. Sunlight protection cream is sunscreen, and there's also equivalent, it's also equivalent to happy pangji cream. Also, juice is fruit sweet water, which is translated into kwai tan mur. Kwai is fruit, tan is sweet, and water is mur. Sori pan is record, sound board. Okay. So, it often appears as interesting and a step further, funny to South Koreans. They make sure that not even a single trace of English word remains in their language, which again reflects their political stance and ideologies. Now, let's turn our attention to the foreign influences of each language. As I mentioned, South Korean has a strong English language influence, whereas North Korean has eliminated English influence while leaving uh, some traces of the Russian language. While English words have a strong influence on the South Korean language, we can see that the Russian still remains in some of the parts of the North Korean language. If we look at the chart right here, um, tractor in South Korean is trekto. You see how it's Koreanized, but it still sounds like tractor in one way or another. But in North Korean, it's traktoru. I don't 
know English, I mean, I don't know Russian, so I don't know if this sounds、uh, Russian enough, but traktor is the North Korean version of tractor. Fin is chuje in Korean. This doesn't really have、uh, the same kind of pronunciation in English, but in North Korean, it's tema, theme. Poland in South Korean is Poland, and North Korean, Polska. Czech Republic in South Korean is Czechko, and in North Korean, it's Czesko Slovensko. I think it sounds pretty much like Russian.、Um, in fact, the North Korean language has embraced many Chinese and Russian words. In contrast, the South Korean lexicon includes many English and Japanese expressions as loan words. Now that we have An overview of the linguistic differences. Let's look at what social implications this may create. Here's a short video of an interview with a North Korean defector. As a matter of fact, due to these linguistic differences and many hardship, many Korean defectors, North Korean defectors, claim to have confronted various difficulties while adapting to the South Korean society. So let's look at. This interview, where where he says that he has a hard time adjusting to the Korean society. After completing a deadly journey to escape from the Hermit Kingdom, one would assume the worst has passed for defectors. But apparently, adjusting and settling down in a very different Korea offers a whole new set of challenges. Kim Hye Sung sheds light on why redefecting wasn't a difficult choice for some North Koreans. Im Ji Hyun, a North Korean defector who fled to the South in 2014 and became a TV personality, disappeared. Lee Joo Hong, a North Korean defector who came to the South 10 years ago, says adjusting to life here wasn't easy. When I first came to Seoul, I was shocked that even the language we use is different. South Koreans use a lot of words combined with English, like hanamatu, making day-to-day -day communication difficult. Upon arrival, North Korea's、yeah, so、defectors go through extensive debriefing and months of the Hanawon resettlement program, where they learn about the differences between the North and South. After the program, each defector receives a rental apartment and government subsidies. During this resettlement the process, they go through linguistic training, goes into language learning. Since 2012, Kim Jong Un has tightened border security. Broker fees have soared. In fact, according to a 2014 survey on North Korean defectors by the Unification Ministry, more than 40% of respondents cited communication problems stemming from foreign words as one of the reasons that make their South Korean lives difficult. The Korean language used in North and South Korea diverge 34% and 64% in regular vocabulary and technical terms. We can see that we are basically the same Koreans. We come from the same peninsula. We are from the Korean Peninsula, but and we can also say that we speak a very similar language. But it still makes it difficult for them to learn the South Korean version of Korean. As part of the efforts to bridge the gap between South Korean and North Korean, the two Koreas have participated in a language compilation project aimed at unifying the Korean language since 2005. This is to prepare for the potential reunification in the future. Although it's roughly 75% complete, the effort was suspended due to increased tensions from nuclear testing and the closing of the Kaesong Industrial Complex in the north. It is expected to be completed by 2022. We can see that both governments are making efforts and are trying to prepare, more or less, for the reunification that might potentially happen sometime in the future. They also acknowledge that these linguistic gap might pose problems 
when a when an abrupt reunification happens. So they are trying to prepare in advance, and among among uh, many other projects like economic projects, uh, social policy, welfare, linguistic project is something that's really at the core of the agenda. Okay, so everybody, Korea. I've talked a lot about Korea and about um, its history, its languages and culture, foreign influences, right? So Korea, this is the peninsula I live in. I live in Seoul, so yeah, in North Korea, in South Korea. So Korea, it's not just about missiles and nuclear program. Like you have seen throughout my PowerPoint presentation, Korea is a country with a long linguistic tradition and history. Not only languages, but also culture, history, monuments, people. We have so much to offer. Well, it was truly an honor to speak on behalf of my language and my country. I hope this presentation helped you in some way. And I hope to talk to you even after the presentation regarding Korea and the Korean language. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And yeah, let's connect. So this is my Instagram ID, Judy on Korean Polyglot. If you type this name, you will find me. And my ID specifically is language anecdotes. So if you have any uh, questions or concerns or doubts about my presentation or just in Korea in general, please feel free to reach out to me. I will always be there for you. And I would be very, very happy to um, assist you on this journey to getting to, kn to know more about Korea. Thank you so much for your attention and I'll see you in the future.